When Saf Tammy beheld him coming, he raised his eyes, which were generally fixed on the nothing which lay on the roadway opposite his seat, and, seeming dazzled, as if by a burst of sunshine, rubbed them, and shaded them with his hand. Then he started up and raised his hand aloft in a denunciatory manner as he spoke. "'Vanity of vanities,' saith the preacher. "'All is vanity. Mon be warned in time. Behold the lilies of the field. They toil not, neither do they spin, yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Mon, mon, thy vanity is as the quicksand which swallows a pole which comes within its spell. Beware vanity. Beware of the quicksand which yawneth for thee, and which will swallow thee up. See thyself, learn mine own vanity. Meet thyself face to face, and then in that moment thou shalt learn the fatal force of thy vanity. Learn it, know it, and repent ere the quicksand swallow thee. Then without another word he went back to his seat and sat there, immovable and expressionless as before. Markham could not but feel a little upset by this tirade, only that it was spoken by a seeming madman. He would have put it down to some eccentric exhibition of Scottish humour or impudence, but the gravity of the message, for it seemed nothing else, made such a reading impossible. He was, however, determined not to give in to ridicule, and although he had not yet seen anything in Scotland to remind him even of a kilt, he determined to wear his highland dress. When he returned home, in less than half an hour, he found that every member of the family was, despite the headaches, out taking a walk. He took the opportunity afforded by their absence of locking himself in his dressing room, took off the highland dress, and, putting on a suit of flannels, lit a cigar and had a snooze. He was awakened by the noise of the family coming in, and at once donning his dress, made his appearance in the drawing-room for tea. He did not go out again that afternoon, but after dinner he put on his dress again. He had, of course, dressed for dinner as usual, and went by himself for a walk on the seashore. He had by this time come to the conclusion that he would get by degrees accustomed to the highland dress before making it his ordinary wear. The moon was up, and he easily followed the path through the sand-hills, and shortly struck the shore. The tide was out and the beach firm as a rock, so he strolled southwards to nearly the end of the bay. Here he was attracted by two isolated rocks some little way out from the edge of the dunes, so he strolled towards them. When he reached the nearest one he climbed it, and sitting there, elevated some fifteen or twenty feet above the waste of sand, enjoyed the lovely peaceful prospect. The moon was rising behind the headland of Pennyfold, and its light was just touching the top of the furthest most rock of the spurs some three quarters of a mile out. The rest of the rocks were in dark shadow. As the moon rose over the headland, the rocks of the spurs and then the beach by degrees became flooded with light. For a good while Mr. Markham sat and looked at the rising moon and the growing light, area of light which followed its rise. Then he turned and faced eastwards, and sat with his chin in his hand looking seawards, and revelling in the peace and beauty and freedom of the scene. The roar of London, the darkness and the strife and the weariness of London life, seemed to have passed quite away, and he lived at the moment of freer and higher life. He looked at the glistening water as it stole its way over the flat waste of sand, coming closer and closer insensibly. The tide had turned. Presently he heard a distant shouting along the beach very far off. Fishermen calling to each other, he said to himself, and looked around. As he did so, he got a horrible shock, for though just then a cloud sailed across the moon he saw, in spite of the sudden darkness around him, his own image, for an instant, on the top of the opposite rock, he could see the bald back of the head, and the Glengarry cap with the immense eagle's feather. As he staggered back, his foot slipped, and he began to slide down towards the sand between the two rocks. He took no concern as to failing, for the sand was really only a few feet below him, and his mind was occupied with a figure, or simulacrum of himself, which had already disappeared. As the easiest way of reaching terra firma, he prepared to jump the remainder of the distance. All this had taken but a second, but the brain works quickly and even as he gathered himself for the spring he saw the sand below him lying so marbly level shake and shiver in an odd way a sudden fear overcame him his knees failed and instead of jumping he slid miserably down the rock scratching his bare legs as he went his feet touched the sand and threw it like water and he was down below his knees before he realised that he was in a quick sand wildly he gasped up the rock to keep himself from sinking further unfortunately there was a jutting spur or edge which he was able to grasp instinctively to this he clung in grim desperation. He tried to shout, but his breath would not come, till after a great effort his voice rang out. Again he shouted, and it seemed as if the sound of his own voice gave him new courage, for he was able to hold on to the rock for a longer time than he thought possible, though he held on only in blind desperation. He was, however, 
beginning to find his grasp weakening when joy of joys his shout was answered by a rough voice from just above him god be thank it i'm near too late and a fisherman with great thigh boots came hurriedly climbing over the rock in an instant he recognised the gravity of the danger and with a cheering hold fast mon i'm coming scrambled down till he found a firm foothold then with one strong hand holding the rock above he leaned down and catching markham's wrist called out to him hold to me mon hold to me we are the hond then he lent his great strength and with a steady sturdy pull dragged him out of the hungry quicksand and placed him safe upon the rock hardly giving time to draw breath he pulled and pushed him never letting him go for an instant over the rock into the firm sand beyond it and finally deposit him still shaking from the magnitude of his danger high upon the beach then he began to speak mon but i was just in time if i had no laughed at you foolish lads and begin to rin at the first you'd have been sinking down to the bowels of the earth by the new woolly bagrey thought you was a guest and tom macphail swore he was only like a goblin on a puddock steel nah said i yon's but the daft englishman that loony that had escaped is for the waxworks i was thinking that being strange and silly if not a whole made feel ye'd no ken the ways of the quicksand i shouted to warn ye and they ran to drag ye aff if need be but god be thank it be a fool or only half daft wi your vanity and i was no that late and he reverently lifted his cap as he spoke mr markham was deeply touched and thankful for his escape from a horrible death but the sting of the charge of vanity thus made once more against him come through his humility he was about to reply angrily when suddenly a great awe fell upon him as he remembered the warning words of the half-crazy letter-carrier meet thyself face to face and repent ere the quicksand shall swallow thee here too he remembered the image of himself that he had seen and the sudden danger from the deadly quicksand that had followed he was silent a full minute and then said my good fellow i owe you my life the answer came with reverence from the hardy fisherman na na you're that to god but as for me i'm only too glad to be the humble instrument of his mercy but you will let me thank you said mr markham taking both the great hands of his deliverer in his and holding them tight my heart is too full as yet and my nerves are too much shaken to let me say much but believe me i am very very grateful it was quite evident that the poor old fellow was deeply touched for the tears were running down his cheeks the fisherman said with a rough but true courtesy ay sir thank me and you will if it'll do your poor heart good and i'm thinking that if it were me i'd be thankful too but sir as for me i need no thanks i am glad so i am that arthur fernley markham was really thankful and grateful was shown practically later on within a week's time there sailed into port crooken the finest fishing smack that had ever been seen in the harbour of peterhead she was fully found with sails and gear of all kinds and with nets of the best her master and men went away by the coach after having left with Simon Fisher's wife the papers which made her over to him. As Mr. Markham and the Simon Fisher walked together along the shore, the former asked his companion not to mention the fact that he had been in such imminent danger, for that it would only distress his dear wife and children. He said that he would warn them all of the quicksand, and for that purpose he, then and there, asked questions about it till he felt that his information on the subject was complete. Before they parted, he asked his companion if he had happened to see a second figure, dressed like himself on the other rock as he had approached to succour him na na came the answer there is na sick another fool in these parts nor has there been since the time of jamie flamin him that were fool to the laird of udney why mon sick a heathenish dress as ye have on till he has nae seen in these parts with the memory o mon and i'm thinking that sick a dress was never for sitting on the cold rock as ye done beyond mon but do ye not fear a rheumatism or the lumbergy with flopping doon on the cold stains with your bare flesh i was thinking that it was daft you were when i see the moon and doon the pot but it's fool or idiot you maun be for the look o that mr markham did not care to argue the point and as they were now close to his own home he asked the salmon fisher to have a glass of whisky which he did and they parted for the night he took good care to warn all his family of the quicksand telling them that he had himself been in some danger from it all that night he never slept he heard the hours strike one after the other, but try how he would, he could not get to sleep. Over and over again he went through the horrible episode of the quicksand, from the time that Saftami had broken his habitual silence to preach to him of the sin of vanity and to warn him. The question kept ever arising in his mind, am I then so vain as to be in the ranks of the foolish? 
and the answer ever came in the words of the crazy prophet vanity of vanities all is vanity meet thyself face to face and repent ere the quicksand shall swallow thee somehow a feeling of doom began to shape itself in his mind that he would yet perish in that same quicksand for there he had already met himself face to face in the grey of the morning he dozed off but it was evident that he continued the subject in his dreams for he was fully awakened by his wife who said do sleep quietly that blessed island of silk has got on your brain don't talk in your sleep if you can help it he was somehow conscious of a glad feeling as if some terrible weight had been lifted from him but he did not know any cause of it he asked his wife what he had said in his sleep and she answered you said it often enough godness knows for one to remember it not face to face a sort of a eagle plume over the bald head there is hope yet not face to face go to sleep do and then he did go to sleep for he seemed to realise that the prophecy of the crazy man had not yet been fulfilled he had not met himself face to face as yet at all events he was awakened early by a maid who came to tell him that there was a fisherman at the door who wanted to see him he dressed himself as quickly as he could for he was not yet expert with the highland dress and hurried down not wishing to keep the salmon fisher waiting he was surprised and not altogether pleased to find that his visitor was none other than soft tammy who at once opened fire on him i'm on gang about the post but i thought that i would waste an hour on you and caroon to see if you were still that foo with vanities on the nicht gone by and i see that you no learn the lesson well time is coming sure enough however i have all the time in the mornings to mainsail so i look round just till i see how you gang you and get to the quicksand and then to the dell i'm after my work the new and he went straight away leaving mr markham considerably vexed for the maids within earshot were vainly trying to conceal their giggles he had fairly made up his mind to wear on that day ordinary clothes, but the visit of Saftami reversed his decision. He would show them all that he was not a coward, and he would go on as he had begun, come what might. When he came to breakfast in full martial panoply, the children, one and all, held down their heads and the backs of their necks became very red indeed. As, however, none of them laughed, except Titus, the youngest boy, who was seized with a fit of hysterical choking and was promptly banished from the room, he could not reprove them but began to break his egg with a sternly determined air it was unfortunate that as his wife was handing him a cup of tea one of the buttons of his sleeve caught in the lace of a morning wrapper with the result that the hot tea was spilt over his bare knees not unnaturally he made use of a swear word whereupon his wife somewhat nettled spoke out well arthur if you will make such an idiot of yourself with that ridiculous costume what else can you expect you are not accustomed to it and you never will be in answer he began an indignant speech with madam but he got no further for now that the subject was broached mrs markham intended to have her say out it was not a pleasant say and truth to tell it was not said in a pleasant manner a wife's manner seldom is pleasant when she undertakes to tell what she considers truths to her husband the result was that arthur fernley markham undertook then and there that during his stay in scotland he would wear no other costume than the one she abused womanlike his wife had the last word even in this case with tears very well arthur of course you will do as you choose make me as ridiculous as you can and spoil the poor girl's chances in life young men don't seem to care as a general rule for an idiot father-in-law but i must warn you that your vanity will some day get a rude shock if indeed you are not before then in an asylum or dead it was manifest after a few days that mr markham would have to take the major part of his outdoor exercise by himself the girls now and again took a walk with him chiefly in the early morning or late at night or on a wet day when there would be no one about they professed to be willing to go out at all times but somehow something always seemed to occur to prevent it the boys could never be found at all on such occasions and as to mrs markham she sternly refused to go out with him on any consideration so long as he should continue to make a fool of himself on the sunday he dressed himself in his habitual broadcloth for he rightly felt that church was not a place for angry feelings but on monday morning he resumed his highland garb by this time he would have given a good deal if he had never thought of the dress but his british obstinacy was strong and he would not give in saftami called at his house every morning and not being able to see him nor have any message to take him to him he used to call back in the afternoon when the letter-bag had been delivered and watched for his going out on such occasions he never failed to warn him against his vanity in the same words which he had used at the first before many days were over mr markham had come to look upon him as little short of a scourge